Good evening, everyone. My name is Carly Leggett, and I'm the Interim Executive Director here at the George and Faye Center for Healthcare Innovation. I'd like to welcome all of you tonight to the 2021 Academic Health Sciences Leadership Program keynote address. We are delighted to have Dr. Brian Postel join us to reflect on his 40 years in healthcare and explore some of the challenges and opportunities that he has seen. I wanna start by acknowledging that the Center for Healthcare Innovation and the University of Manitoba are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Here at CHI, we respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and present, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Dr. Postel has spent much of his career focused on reducing inequities in health and medicine and in anti-racist advocacy work. And I'm very much looking forward to some of his reflections in this area. A few quick um, items for housekeeping. Our speaker has no conflicts of interest to disclose, and we will be recording tonight's event to post to our CHI YouTube page in the coming weeks. We have a very large and diverse crowd uh, joining us tonight. While we have disabled the use of cameras and microphones, Dr. Postal will be taking questions throughout the session. So please feel free to use the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can post questions anonymously, or if you're feeling bold, please feel free to identify yourself. I'd now like to invite Dr. Brock Wright, former Chief Executive Officer at Shared Health Manitoba, to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody. Um, today's talk by uh, Dr. Postal is titled Reflecting on 40 Years of Challenges in Healthcare. And I should mention that I had offered um, to do a talk for the organizers titled Reflecting on 35 Years Working For and With Dr. Postal, where I promised to reveal all, but the organizers preferred to hear from Dr. Postal instead. Uh, so I will keep my introduction uh, very short. Um, in the mid 80s, uh, after I'd spent a year working for the Northern Medical Unit, uh, now called on Gomazin, and uh, nearing the end of my first year of internal medicine residency training, I was very actively exploring specialty and subspecialty career options. And I was uh, very intrigued at the time by a new Royal College specialty program called Community Medicine that focused on public health and population health. And Dr. Postol was at the time co-director of the residency training program and also director of the Northern Medical Unit, having assumed that role after his mentor, uh, Dr. Jack Hildes had passed away. Dr. Postol uh, had graduated from medicine in 1976 from the University of Manitoba. And then he went on to obtain uh, fellowships in two programs in community medicine and in pediatrics in 1981 and 1982, respectively. Now, when I first met Dr. Postal in 1987 to discuss the community medicine residency training program, uh, he was very engaging and persuasive, as we all know uh, Brian can be. And it wasn't just because of the way he combed his hair or his flashy clothes or his endless stories about growing up in the North End. There was something uh, fundamentally different I found about him. Uh, yes, he had a, a real passion for clinical medicine and caring for children, and he had a deep, deep passion for the Indigenous communities he served, but he also had a really keen interest in the larger healthcare system and the broader determinants of health and how they could be influenced to better support the health of the population. And that at the time uh, was very much aligned with my interests. Uh, and so I made the decision to pursue community medicine, much to the shock of many of my close colleagues who had wondered if I'd perhaps lost my mind. Uh, but I would never have made that decision had it not been for Dr. Postal. In that same year, 1987, the J.A. Hildes Northern Medical Unit and the Division of Social and Preventive Medicine within the Faculty of Medicine merged to form the Department of Community Health Sciences. And Brian served as the founding chair of this new department until 1994, when he was then appointed chair of the Department of Pediatrics. Now the 1990s were a very turbulent time. And in 1997, regional health authorities were established for the first time in Winnipeg. 
the Winnipeg Community and Long-Term Care Authority, otherwise known as the WCA, and the Winnipeg Hospital Authority, known as the WHA. And in 1997, uh, Dr. Postel became the Vice President and Chief Medical Officer for the new Winnipeg Hospital Authority. In late 1999, the WCA and the WHA merged to form the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, and Dr. Postel became the founding CEO of that organization, a position he held until 2010, when he left that role to uh, become the Dean of Medicine at the University of Manitoba. Now, during Brian's tenure as CEO of WRHA, a, he established a matrix management structure, which had uh, community areas and hospitals along one dimension of the matrix and uh, program leadership along the other dimension of the matrix. And uh, during those years, despite very, very significant, significant challenges, great strides were made in better integrating community and hospital-based care. I uh, had the privilege of being the chief medical officer during that period, and so I was part of w Brian's WRHA leadership team. And as I look back, there were many things that my colleagues and I really appreciated about Brian. And I'll share a few of those in particular, given that this is a program focused uh, for students on, on leadership. First, Brian is a uh, really remarkable listener, which uh, is not all that common. Now, some people that have known us over the years have sort of wondered why I failed to pick up from Brian that listening skill. But if you understood that I developed a more evolved uh, and more difficult skill of listening while talking. When making decisions, uh, both in the health system and at the university, um, Brian, uh, something we really admired was that Brian was always most influenced by what was in the best interests of patients and clients and students. That was the lens uh, he always uh, applied most strongly. We also appreciated his very calm demeanor, uh, particularly during stressful and, and trying periods. He always maintained his cool and he could always put others around him at ease. And for those that worked for him, uh, we really appreciated uh, the fact that he trusted the members of his team and he allowed them considerable latitude. Uh, although there were times, although not very often, uh, when Brian did not agree with me, but uh, all that really proves is that even someone of Brian Postel's stature can be wrong at times. And that is both important and reassuring, I think, for students to know. So I'm sure Brian won't mind me sharing that. Finally, uh, Brian uh, has always had a remarkable ability to manage relationships uh, with those above his head, uh, be it boards or governments, special interest groups, et cetera. And his ability to manage those re relationships really kind of buffered those that worked for him from some of those small P and large P politics. And it really enabled all of us to be more effective. During Brian's tenure as Dean of Medicine at the University of Manitoba, he led the successful integration of the health-related uh, faculties to form the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences. And today, Brian is both the uh, Dean of the Rady Faculty and the Dean of the Max Rady College of Medicine. And I had the privilege of serving for several years as a part-time Associate Dean Clinical Affairs on Brian's leadership team at the university. And that was during a period when there was a lot of planning for the Faculty of Health Sciences. And uh, he brought the same leadership skills and passion to the university as he had uh, to his leadership positions in the uh, health system. And looking back, it's really hard to imagine anyone else who could have a successfully established a new faculty of health sciences. Dr. Postal has always been very involved nationally, uh, participating and leading many national committees, councils, and task forces. Uh, they include past chairman of the Canadian Institute for Health Information, past chair of the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement, co-chair of the CD Howe Health Policy Council, and many, many others, far too numerous to mention. And Dr. Postel has received many honours, including the McNaught Tellian Award in Health Policy, Health Information, and Health Informatics, the Lieutenant Governor's Award for Excellence in Public Administration, Brian was inducted as a fellow in the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, invested in the Order of Manitoba, and appointed a member of the Order of Canada in 2020 for advancing clinical and academic healthcare in Manitoba.
So as you can see, Dr. Postal has really been at the center of many of the major changes in both healthcare and academia over the past 40 years. And he has, of course, had a tremendous influence uh, on the entire system and to those of us who have worked within the system. And so we are all very grateful that, is, that he is here this evening uh, to share some of his many insights and some of his battle scars. So Brian, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Brock. It's a pleasure to uh, be here uh, to give the uh, 11th CHI inaugural uh, leadership lecture. There have been many wonderful speakers that preceded me, and hopefully I can live up to their standard. Uh, I'm particularly appreciative that Brock wore his wedding suit to, uh, to the event tonight, because that's a pretty rare event. Uh, and uh, I should thank him for giving most of my talk in a much shorter period of time than, than I would be able to. Uh, I wondered why there seemed to be such interest uh, in the talk tonight. There seems to be a lot of people uh, that uh, enrolled or are listening. I've always uh, assumed it's because they're hoping that uh, now that I've announced my retirement, I'll come clean with uh, all of the dirt that uh, folks think is out there. Uh, and uh, I'm not quite ready to do that, but maybe one day I will, so hang on. I think the first uh, thing uh, that I, I wanna do is just kind of a summary of themes uh, that uh, have occurred to me over this period of time is that I've worked with a huge number of remarkable people uh, that have really made all of this happen and deserve all of the credit. Uh, just so you know, I've also worked with a smaller group of not so wonderful people who frankly have been easy to forget and an even smaller group of on the schoolyard at Luxton would have been referred to as absolute assholes that have been less easy to forget, uh, but uh, I won't purposely disclose those tonight, uh, but I will answer any direct questions. Perhaps the first theme uh, that I think people in leadership have to understand, uh, certainly in this country and frankly worldwide, is that healthcare is a political phenomenon. Uh, in the 90s and early 2000s, I can't tell you how many seminars I participated in or panels about how do we depoliticize the health system. Uh, and of course, the answer is you can't. It's not a coincidence that uh, the CBC poll of about a decade ago wanting uh, people to vote on the most famous Canadians uh, of all time came up with a first and second place. The first place was Tommy Douglas, who was the father of Medicare or is seen by many as that. Uh, second place, of course, was Wayne Gretzky. So the two H's of our culture in Canada, hockey and healthcare in reverse order, uh, are really what drive much of what goes on. And a lot of the politics occurs in cycles that if you're around long enough, become quite predictable. And in fact, uh, are a standard of expectation uh, if you're living through change. Uh, those parties that are right of center uh, generally come in with an intent to reduce government, uh, reduce expenditures, uh, cut taxes, balance budgets, uh, and uh, would prefer more individual autonomy and responsibility of its citizens, uh, generally have uh, uh, somewhat at least a distrust of bureaucracies who they generally think function left of center. Uh, and all of those characteristics over a period will lead to a reduction in services to the point that at some point the public gets pissed off and throws them out. Those in left of center 
uh, parties generally believe in bigger government. They believe in growing social networks. Uh, they tend to be frankly soft on unions uh, and eventually spend themselves into some difficulty uh, and ultimately uh, either the public gets frightened as taxes increase or as money managers convince the public that the debt and the expenditures are no longer sustainable uh, and they get moved out. So it's a cycle that keeps repeating. Uh, frankly, I think we're living through it right now, both with a, a federal election and uh, some of the changes in our province. All governments blame, blame the previous government as long as they can get away with it, generally a year. Uh, but in general terms, if you really want to see the intent of government uh, and how things are likely to proceed, it's a pretty simple rule that still stands very fast, and that's simply to follow the dollars. Uh, if they are committed to something, they will spend money on it. If they are not committed to it, they will find ways to defer or delay. Now, I've heard a great deal about the use of consultants uh, and reports. Uh, and I wanna assure folks that this is nothing new, that the governments use these vehicles uh, in many different ways. Sometimes it's to actually provide additional or more specific expertise. Sometimes it's to provide political cover for something they want to do, but don't really wanna talk about. Uh, sometimes it's to kick the can down the road uh, so that maybe the issue will go away or at least it'll arrive at a time that's more convenient. Um, so the, 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 the repetitive nature of these issues is not surprising, and I'll go through some of them in a, in a minute or so. The other thing, and Brock alluded to this, is the need for health services, and I'm talking truly of need, uh, is enormously driven by social inequities. And it's a theme that repeats itself over and over and over again in virtually everything we do. Uh, it's always a little surprising to me that it always seems to be a new idea. Uh, it's never been a new idea. It's been around as long as we have. In terms of leadership, uh, I think people really must realize that leadership is about change, that leaders see something and want to make it better. And the only way to get there, you can't make things better without changing. Uh, and the drive to change, I think, is an important part of a healthy health system or educational system, because clearly we're never where we need to be and there's lots of room to move. Now, without, I give a lecture later on the Canadian health system and how it works, but I think it is important to remind folks that health under the constitution and prior to the constitution under the BNA Act is a provincial responsibility. Uh, the federal government has some responsibility around indigenous peoples. Uh, they've never acknowledged the responsibility to provide health care other than as a practice rather than a duty. Uh, and I think uh, that comes up as a repeated theme, this conflict between fed and provincial governments uh, around uh, the care and service uh, needs of, of indigenous people. Now it's an ongoing fight. Uh, it almost is uh, as predictable as everything else. In 1948, the Fed started a grant and aid program at roughly 50% of construction costs. In fact, they were at 100% of many construction costs uh, in, um, six, in the 60s with the, or the 1957, the Hospital Insurance and Diagnostic Services Act. It was a 50-50 split. That was continued with the Medicare Act in the early to mid uh, 60s. Uh, by the 70s, the feds determined they didn't want to spend so much money and the established programs financing act came into place, which became more of a 75-25 split in uh, uh, the feds doing the 25%. But everybody of course forgets, particularly the provinces, uh, 
At the same time, the federal government created tax room that the provinces moved into. So when you hear the debate about the feds needing to put in more money because they're only 25%, that ignores the space they left uh, that the provinces moved into in the late 70s. So it's a pretty typical thing. You're hearing it in the news as we speak. The provinces want more money. They want a 35% contribution from the federal government. Uh, the federal government says they're listening. The provinces don't want any springs, strings attached. Give us the money. You can't tell us what to do. It's our responsibility. Uh, the feds have grown quite tired of that over time. And of course, want to provide money in specific areas. So it may be long-term care, it may be mental health, it may be a pharma care program. Uh, and I think we're seeing that debate play out almost continuously uh, as we go through these things. Uh, the reports have been many uh, and go back a very long time. The Rewa's, the Sirwa Rowell Commission really established the social safety networks in Canada after the Second World War. Uh, the Royal Commission uh, in the 1960s established uh, Medicare. The Lawn Report in 1970 uh, started the discussion around community services and uh, health promotion. The Manitoba White Paper later in that decade really established the community health centers and had a much different community-based approach that in fact has led to the development of what are now access centers. And, in Winnipeg and other parts of the province. 70s Doctors Manitoba wrote a report on the conditions of, uh, of, of Medicare. They weren't uh, very pleased with it. Uh, in the 80s, in our province, there was the Health Services Review Commission, uh, Health Advisory Network soon followed. Uh, and these were really triggered by the beginnings of government saying we're paying too much money, we need to find more efficiencies. Uh, they, uh, the, Largely, the myth of huge waste in the healthcare system started growing and was used for political purposes. Not that there isn't wastage, there's always wastage in any structure, uh, but I've never felt that that was particularly acute uh, in healthcare. The Second Royal Commission uh, in the 80s re established the Canada Health Act, uh, which made some minor but important changes. Uh, in the 90s, as Brock said, there were many reports and at least two of them that he led uh, looking at how do we move to a more regionalized, more efficient, less duplication uh, model. Uh, and uh, ultimately that was followed in the early 2000s with another Royal Commission uh, that ended up saying, we have a good system, let's leave it where it is. But there was also a Senate report uh, by Michael Kirby who said, it's a mess and we need to move to a more university controlled system, academically controlled system with more private uh, involvement. So these things have moved back and forth over many, many years. We've had several reports in our province recently. Uh, some have been excellent. Some in my view have been far less than excellent. Uh, in the end, all of the reports end up making, in my view, the same mistake. We look at the Manitoba population, we do age and sex standardization, which is pretty basic epidemiology, and conclude uh, that once standardized, it appears we, we're spending as much or more money than other jurisdictions, and that's further evidence that there's wastage. Uh, I've tried to convince many reporters that we need to add some degree of standardization around the level of poverty in our province, the degree the indigenous community lives in isolation and without service, uh, the morbidity, the mortality, all of which are high in this province compared to many, many others. So age and sex standardization will always underestimate the health needs of the population in Manitoba. And why is that important? Well, health care, as I said, is political. It eats up, depending on province, somewhere between 40 and 50% of, of the provincial treasure. Uh, so it always generates interest, especially from other departments, as they get squeezed because of growing costs. And when you compare our capacities in Canada to perform against OECD countries, it appears that we pay in the top third 
uh, and function in the bottom third. So all of those things add up to this perpetual pressure on the system to keep adapting, changing, and of course, getting better. So where did this all start <clears throat> for me? Uh, I kind of teased earlier, I may have started in the playground of Luxton School, uh, and Brock kind of alluded to that. But I think it really uh, began for me uh, as uh, a second year medical student, uh, uh, among some other students who had stumbled into the Northern Medical Unit office wondering if there was something uh, to do for a summer job or summer project, uh, as was the case often with Jack Hildes. His first question is, well, why would I bother with you? Um, uh, which he also said to me when I went into the community medicine residency and later when I thought I might want a job in the Northern Medical Unit, uh, that he was always making sure you knew what you were trying uh, to accomplish uh, before he just kind of handed you the opportunity. So I arrived in Shimadawa uh, on a float plane on a snowy day in June. Uh, my reported project that wasn't very well developed was that there had been a rumor that children were gas sniffing. Uh, I spent the next roughly two months or two and a half months recording that virtually every child in Shimadawa was sniffing gas down to and including toddlers, um, which of course was uh, fundamental in, in pointing out the remarkable unfairness uh, and lack of equity in their experience. Uh, we had lots of kids showing up sick from this gas sniffing. It was, uh, um, it was tetraethyl lead, which was used as an anti-knock compound in gasoline because they were all then uh, two-stroke engines up north. Um, the children would just knock the bung off the, uh, off the barrel and siphon out gas and then either hold it in a plastic bag over their mouths and nose, or sometimes soak rags in it. We were able to document virtually 100% of the children. And as they came in occasionally with seizures, uh, somehow the tetraethyl lead part was stuck in my head and I sent off a lead level and got a phone call a few days later from uh, the lab and the health sciences saying these levels are sky high. Now that triggered a huge reaction. Uh, as, the, as this spread and was more widely published, uh, which it was, um, there was growing interest. There were many, many, many children evacuated uh, from Shimadawa to get them out of the community. There was a chelation program, as a matter of fact, uh, to try to lower lead levels. There was a view that lead was indeed uh, the toxic component that later turned out to be uh, the gasoline. Um, I was interviewed by Barbara Frum, and as it happens in those days, that was a relatively big event. And I thought somehow that all of this attention would mean that somebody would start doing something, uh, which of course was a bit on the naive side. The federal government did put in some recreational facilities and coordination, uh, lasted a handful of years, and then was slowly withdrawn. And the theme for me was, once, and we'll see this several times, it was that the root causes were never even discussed or addressed. It was how do we get this out of the public view? The next role after uh, uh, graduation and a bit of uh, residency was to work in Churchill, uh, where the Northern Medical Unit model had been established in 1969. So it's been there a long time was a fascinating mix of young physicians and remarkable specialists who actually provided much of the continuity of care, was a very uh, integrated and developed model that was a terrific experience to work within. Uh, but once again, it was always the same issue. So there was a Dene village on the outskirts of town, which had been a population moved into Churchill for the convenience of government. There was an Inuit community that had been uh, relocated to the Churchill area. There, of course, had been a residential school there. Uh, and in this cluster, uh, it was 
part of our work day that the very some of the highest death rates in Canada were going on in these two side-by-side -side communities. Infant mortality rates were enormous. Uh, finally, uh, the elders uh, of the, the Chippewaian elders got fed up and moved first to North, North Knife Lake, then South Knife Lake, and finally to Tadouli Lake without any initial supports uh, from the federal government. That did follow, um, but after, well after the fact. And once again, this idea of these displaced communities who struggled with the displacement to the point of despair and the display, despair leading to these uh, inequitable health stresses and outcomes was another episode of really band-aiding issues without ever addressing the root causes. Uh, to my surprise, I came down after several years in Churchill to be, uh, I thought, hired by the Northern Medical Unit to uh, take uh, some roles. And to my great surprise, Jack Hildes had instead uh, decided that I would be a resident in community medicine. Uh, and in fact, there was no economic disadvantage because we were paid, I think, $30,000 a year in Churchill. And when I came down to be a resident, it was roughly the same uh, salary. Sharon McDonald, uh, I think, soon followed after me a year or two and entered the program. And there were several others that aren't in Manitoba now that came through. But we were the first cohort to go through a developing, I, I would say, <laughs> developing program because it was so brand new that it was sometimes hard to define. And it was once again so loose in those days that I was also able to continue a residency in pediatrics and move back and forth, which of course would not be allowed now. And it was supported by two remarkable mentors, Jack Hildes and Charlie Ferguson. Now both felt that research was integral to what we needed to do. Uh, and I had another experience that was really uh, remarkable in that in uh, the early, um, I think it would have been around 1983, 1984, there had been a Donner Foundation funded um, uh, perinatal infant morbidity mortality study in the Northwest Territories. Uh, and in my residency, I was asked, would you be willing to do a follow-up? And we uh, ended up doing a follow-up on about 600, uh, in my case, almost all Inuit children. Uh, and I visited every community in now the Eastern Arctic, now Nunavut, um, and did a physical exam on this cohort, did a chart review, measured hemoglobin, uh, and a few other things, and just uh, some other, uh, other growth measurements. Uh, and once again, being able to see all of these communities struggling with the same issues of housing, water quality, education, access to healthcare, uh, the need to be transported very long distances to achieve care uh, was stunning. And uh, the study was equally stunning, the mortality in that childhood age group was about three times the national average. 7% of this group had had meningitis by the time they were seven years of age and in this cohort, and 7% had, had lost a sibling by the time they were seven years of age. So once again, all of these things kept pointing to these horrible inequities that of course uh, still continue and we'll talk more about um, upon finishing uh, the residency, Jack Hildes uh, did get sick, and I was asked, for perhaps reasons unclear to me, to step in. Um, and of course, it was a remarkable education experience to be immersed in the politics between the federal government, the provincial government, and of course, the indigenous community, where we tried to focus very much on recruitment and retention of services, uh, because that wasn't an easy task. Uh, we always knew uh, that the only way this was going to work, and this really came through Jack Hildes uh, and all of the cohort, Sharon McDonald and myself and others, uh, that we were kind of placeholders. The only way this was going to work was when Indigenous people could manage these things on their own. Uh, and it was in this period 
uh, that the university, I think with Foresight, developed what was then the Specialty Medical Studies Program to start introducing more Indigenous students into uh, health and other health, or medicine and other health professions uh, that continues in a bit of a different form to this day, but has now graduated hundreds and hundreds of Indigenous health professionals. Uh, the politics of, of course, Indigenous health care is always intense because we're not talking even about two jurisdictions uh, or two nations. We're talking about three and multiple nations in the second, and these nations are not homogenous and all have their own uh, quite remarkable needs and often have their own quite remarkable leadership with strong intentions. Uh, it was fun to the extent that sometimes we'd be meeting and we were young and very serious and maybe took ourselves a bit too seriously. And we'd be thinking we were negotiating a contract, uh, trying to involve the communities in that negotiation, even though the federal government had no interest in the communities being involved. They just wanted to talk to us about the contract. So we would then meet with chiefs and councils to go over the potential contract. Uh, and in those days, the federal government paid almost all of the bill and began then to offload some of the cost to the province with the claim that, frankly, healthcare is a provincial responsibility. And eventually, the province paid for the doctors, the feds paid for overhead and, uh, and travel. Uh, but a, a funny little story that I still chuckle about we were in A106 in this building. Uh, that many of you have been in, and we were negotiating with the Island Lake chiefs uh, about a contract, and they were upset about some levels of service and perhaps less upset with other levels of service, but they really kind of had us on our heels. Uh, and we thought it was a bit of a tense meeting, what was seemed to be going fine. And uh, finally, uh, you could see there was some signaling going on. They all stood up and walked out of the room. And we were young and clearly a bit naive about this kind of stuff. So we thought we'd really screwed up terribly uh, and uh, kind of limped out of the room. Uh, and as we're walking out of that room and towards the front door, uh, we see about eight taxis come and get everybody. Uh, and uh, we suddenly realized that the reason they got up and walked out of the room at that precise time is they were all going to the jet game that night uh, and they didn't want to bother sitting through the rest of anything with us. But it was a terrific and humbling lesson about our own perhaps sense of importance. We all felt in those days, and I think we also got this from Jack, that uh, Jack Hildes, that if we just worked harder, uh, we could make progress and people would start paying attention. And one of the things that would help them make attention if we were able to provide more information, more data uh, that would convince the world that these things were not right. Uh, and we were very engaged in research projects and trying to publish things. We were uh, Jack and Otto Schaefer in, uh, from Alberta had set the seeds for some national and international organizations. We were able to complete uh, the growth uh, of those organizations, the Canadian Society of Circumpolar Health and the International Union of Circumpolar Health, and use those as vehicles to spread awareness and knowledge and did try to indigenize those, uh, those agencies as best we could. Uh, but once again, it was a very similar issue that uh, the root causes of everything that we were dealing with were never part of the discussions. Now, as Brock said, we uh, then um, we had two parallel streams. The Division of Community Medicine included the Northern Medical Unit. It also included occupational health, the Specialty Medical Studies Program, uh, environmental health. All these things were growing as, as the public health community and, and stretch were occurring in the province. And we had a parallel department of the social, social preventative medicine headed by David Fish, another remarkable academic. Uh, and of course, we were overlapping in teaching and overlapping in the then growing community medicine program that Brock became part of. Um, that's uh, 
it began to be a discussion of whether this should come together. And, and it was a, always a fascinating discussion because uh, the question of culture and different cultures and culture always beats anything objective uh, became clear. This one was a PhD based effort. One was an MD based effort. Um, but we were able, I think, through ongoing discussion to figure out ways to better coordinate and integrate and reduce duplication and then redirect dollars and some of the dollars from the overhead of the Northern Medical Unit became very instrumental uh, in building uh, a graduate program that I think now is probably the biggest graduate program in the university and highly successful and uh, highly productive. Uh, but the uh, issue of could social preventative medicine ever tolerate an MD being in charge of the both programs uh, as, as they came. And this because, has always been a fascinating theme to me, um, but does speak, I think, to some of these issues of culture that come around again a, a few more times uh, as I pass through things. During this period, we also did many uh, consultations to other indigenous communities because in this period of time, the federal government was promoting what they call transfer of control mechanisms to say we are going to transfer control to indigenous communities for health services. Uh, we did many assessments. Uh, we did one for uh, the Blood Indian tribe in Alberta. Uh, they wanted a hospital. All of the evidence seemed to point to they're very large that they should have a hospital on site. Uh, the province really was not uh, very open to it. Uh, and as we did the needs assessment, we discovered that there are four communities, white communities in the corners of this huge blood Indian reserve that all had hospitals built claiming the entire population of the blood Indian tribe. So ultimately we were able to negotiate not a hospital, but a very good uh, uh, health center. The, in all of these transfers, the federal government was uh, absolutely unbelievable insofar as they would start the transfer discussions. Uh, we would have trouble sorting out what the base of funding that existed was because it wasn't easily shared or they didn't want to share it, uh, only to discover that while the discussions were going on, the base was being eroded. So if you ever got to the point of transfer, it would be less of a transfer than anybody had anticipated. And I think in, uh, throughout this period, the antipathy, growing antipathy between uh, the federal government and indigenous communities as they strove for these issues of control and autonomy and nationhood uh, really came, I think, much more to the fore that uh, you won't remember, but in 1969, uh, Trudeau uh, and Chrétien had proposed uh, a white paper that would abolish the Indian Act but not be replaced with anything. That was followed in the 70s by a red paper by a collection of communities across Canada. And I think it really led to a terrible rift between the two communities, the federal government and the indigenous community that lasted, in my view, for decades. And of course, uh, the treaties were part of the discussions, as was the medicine chess clause. And now maybe I can stop there and see if there's any questions before I. Absolutely. Thank you. And just a reminder to those joining online, um, you can post questions in the Q&A function in the Zoom box. So I do have a couple for you, Dr. Postal. Um, the first comes from Dr. Liz Doyle, one of our fantastic emerge, uh, pediatric eMERGE physicians here at HSC. So thank you, Dr. Doyle, for kicking us off. Um, so if you think about the phrase, never, ever compromise the high road, can you share an example where this has been a challenge for you and how you handled that? Uh, I'll come to that. <laughs> okay, we're going to pause on that question. I do have one more um, from Dr. Kate Sibley, our director of KT at uh, Knowledge Translation at Center for Healthcare Innovation. Dr. Sibley says, thank you, Dr. Postal, for sharing your insights. What advice do you have for those working in health services and health research for riding the wave between the cyclical governing approaches or approaches you discussed early in your comments? 
Well, I think that's a terrific question because there is a wave and, and interests do wax and wane depending on the government and their interests and their willingness to fund things. Uh, you know, I think the, the issue is one of uh, forming social networks that you can function within that can promote what you're doing to find other routes uh, to best continue the research, even if funding gets tight. Um, so you've got to be able to, in effect, sell your product, be passionate about what you're trying to project, uh, because uh, folks pay attention uh, to passion. They don't pay attention to anger. So somewhere in between those two, uh, I think you've got to keep yourself going, knowing that the kind of work you're doing ultimately will improve you know, the lot and stock of, uh, of the people that you're, you're working with. Thank you. And Dr. Ray, did you want to ask any questions at this time? Okay. So move, as um, I finished a term uh, as uh, the head in community health sciences uh, and in, on an administrative leave was asked, which was fascinating to me uh, by the conservative government of the day to lead a task force on the health of Manitoba's children. Uh, which I, of course, was uh, passionate about, so it was an easy decision to make. Uh, they created a very large task force. I think there was over 50 people with a very, very broad range of interests. Um, and we worked hard for a year uh, on this task force. We had ended up coming to a pretty much a consensus report. And, and what the consensus report say, it was, and we were totally data-driven in what we presented, uh, that there were many, many silos in the health of children's lives, uh, that uh, the silos did not support integration, did not support families very effectively, often had children and families passing between sites, trying to get complete sets of service. This is of course, particularly so with children uh, with uh, any form of disabilities. Um, Indigenous children were very clearly, uh, we were able to report um, suffering the ill effects uh, of the systems they were living within. Uh, we did a review of all of the ICD-9 codes at the time for children less than, uh, I think it was 16, and discovered that every code, uh, Indigenous children were between two and 10 times more likely to be hospitalized. Uh, we repeated that actually a few years ago. I gave a talk on the health of Indigenous children. We repeated it, I think it would have been 2017 or 18. It was precisely the same graph. The, the differential wasn't quite as high, uh, but the picture uh, was almost identical. We, of course, uh, focused on children living in poverty in Manitoba, as most of you might know, generally is either first or second in the proportion of children living within poverty and how that poverty then translated into needs for family services uh, and criminal involvement. And of course, foster care, where most of the children involved in foster care placements are indigenous. It's been referred to and some ways as uh, the continuation uh, of, of residential schools. Um, and the children in rural areas had some significant access issues. So we uh, wrote the report. It was quite fascinating. Uh, and we got a phone call from the then uh, assistant deputy minister, who I was very fond of. Uh, saying that they decided they didn't want to publish the report uh, because it wasn't quite, quite in the political cycle to want to come out and say that we were in trouble. And uh, that was a little bit difficult, but in the end, all I could point out because I had some signals this was coming and I had quickly distributed the report to all of the committee members, many of whom were social advocates. So there were 60 reports out there and I finally said to him, do you really think that, I would never do it, of course, but do you really think that none of these 60 are gonna distribute this report for a broader distribution? And ultimately uh, 
uh, they published the report, but it's, uh, I'll describe another episode later of a report that uh, I didn't think was going to get published. So I moved then to the Department of Pediatrics. Um, and this was in the 90s. Uh, there had been changes throughout the early and mid 90s that were substantial. This was the period where the federal government slashed transfer payments because their debt ratios were so high. This is where Paul Martin was the Minister of Finance. Um, there were bed closures. Uh, and for, as examples, obstetric was pulled out of several hospitals and centralized pediatrics at St. Boniface hospitals closed. Beds were closed at the major uh, general hospitals. Uh, there were multiple task force uh, forces. Brock was in the middle of and managed uh, brilliantly. There were multiple consultants that were trying to tell Brock what to do, but I'll leave that for his lecture. Uh, but it all ended up coming down to this issue of program consolidation, backroom consolidation, finding efficiencies that included things like food services, laundry services, um, the use of potential program management models, the ideas of centers of excellence. Our report came out in the middle of it. Mental health services really arrived in a big way during this period of time uh, and really, drew very similar conclusions to the 70s reports of the Health Services Review Committee and the Health Advisory Network. And of course, it was all with the theme that there were no dollars. This was, it was never, it was never designed politically, they claimed, uh, as a way to cut costs. It was always to make the system better. It just also happened to cut costs, which of course gets a very thin audience pretty quickly because in the end, nobody really believes that. Um, this was also the era of Connie Curran. If there's any nurses, they might remember that name. So she was brought in as another consultant um, with, I think, the promise Brock was to find $40 million uh, looking for efficiencies in nursing. Uh, in particular, I think she ultimately found $10 million. And this was the period of time which we're interestingly now living with, where the view was that there were a lot of nursing layoffs. There actually weren't true nursing layoffs. What, what happened was the full-time equivalents were reduced and nurses began working part-time uh, to satisfy the fiscal requirements. Uh, and then frankly, lo and behold, uh, kind of decided they kind of liked the idea of working part-time and then occasionally taking overtime shifts uh, because it gave them that much more flexibility around family and other issues. Huge threats, as there have been uh, recently, to rehab services um, and how to rationalize that particular change. It was a changing world as these huge fiscal pressures descended. Uh, and of course, this was going on at the same time that subspecialization was increasing within uh, healthcare uh, and the old guys that used to take call one and one and thought it was part of the job and maybe they had some fiscal benefit from it. Uh, change that was no longer acceptable and it was really one in three or one in four or one in five, uh, which put huge uh, cost pressures uh, on the system. Uh, and often uh, the differential payment that went throughout the medical specialties was getting more attention so that pediatrics and psychiatry and family medicine appeared to be relatively poorly funded, the surgical specialties and the interventions highly funded. We had, there were lots of uh, discussions about how to work into new systems of payment for physicians, none of which have ever been able to uh, come to fruition. Now, there were a few key things during my uh, time in uh, pediatrics. We worked hard to expand our outreach into the north. We had several attempted efforts to uh, get more involved uh, in Thompson in particular. Uh, we started sending teams into communities around RSV outbreaks. Um, and really we're trying to change the tone of pediatrics so that it wasn't entirely hospital and bed-based in its focus. Uh, 
Now, in the middle of that, I started in, I think, September of 1994. Uh, I walked into what's later been known as the pediatric cardiac inquest, where over a period of uh, about a year, uh, there had been growing concerns of a number of deaths of, uh, of children with cardiac uh, anomalies. Um, significantly based in anesthesia and nursing. The program was stopped in the spring of that year before I started. There was an internal review which concluded just as I was getting there that the program should again proceed, which it did. Uh, and then of course there were growing concerns about uh, a subsequent uh, number of deaths. Uh, it got a lot of public attention. Um, we did an initial external review after uh, we stopped the program and the way we stopped the program, I think it outlined that in a children's hospital, we had too many departments all calling their own shots with nobody integrating or in a position uh, to manage the whole. Uh, we stopped the program by in essence saying our intensive care units would no longer be available. Had an external review, they expressed concern. Uh, the parental concern and the media involvement was very intense, uh, led to an inquest uh, that over the next roughly five years, um, did a very thorough, uh, remarkable uh, review of the issue. Uh, the issue is largely related, frankly, to case selection and probably some supervision and accountability. Uh, the teams weren't functioning well as teams. The question is, is there a learning curve that, that new surgeons should be allowed uh, as they get up to speed, which uh, I thought and most people thought was pretty unacceptable as a concept. Uh, there were lots of divisions within the hospital, one side or the other of the debate. Uh, and uh, the fear that if the program didn't continue, we would have trouble recruiting cardiologists and intensivists because they, that was an integral part of their role. In the end, the, uh, the inquest did recommend uh, a couple of things and pointed out, which we had learned through this process that, and we've known in other routes that volumes and outcomes are tied together very closely in these intricate areas. Uh, and that if you don't have enough volume, you're, neither your surgeons nor your teams will likely have uh, the skills to effectively manage in the long term. Uh, so the idea then became, at least I thought it became, that we should look at developing a regional program. And we first went out to Toronto and talked to sick kids. And, you know, because my hope was we could build something that was integrated that we would be part of, not just send patients. Uh, the sick kids, uh, were, was, they were polite and happy to take our cases, uh, but didn't have any interest in working with us or our cardiologists or our management. At the time, Saskatchewan had a single cardiac surgeon with even less volume. So we didn't think that would be a marriage made in heaven. Uh, Edmonton had had similar issues, maybe not quite as intense in outcomes, uh, and uh, went so far as to recruit at a very high cost one of the better surgeons uh, in Toronto to come to Edmonton. So we really began discussions with Edmonton and then involved Saskatoon and Calgary and Vancouver to say, why don't we have a regional program where the surgery is only done in one site, but the cardiac care can be done in multiple sites and integrate the effort. So the governments had some passing interest in this. Uh, they set up two committees, one after the other, asked me to chair both, which I thought was fascinating. It's just they clearly weren't ready for the first report because the second report was almost identical as you might expect to the first report. Uh, and finally, the deputies agreed. We, uh, the second report really spent a lot of time trying to develop a funding model because there to this day are no experiences of shared programs between provinces in this country where they're jointly funded, jointly managed. Uh, and this really became the first uh, and became Edmonton based for the surgery, although relatively 
uh, within a few years, uh, British Columbia, who of course has always an intense competitive relationship with Alberta decided they needed their own surgeon and recruited one. So it's now a bit of a split. Uh, and I honestly, uh, when I uh, took on another role, I kind of gave up that role and I haven't really stayed in touch. So I don't know how well it's continuing to function and maybe someone on the call uh, would know. Now the next step was really as Rock described the, the move to the WHA as the chief medical officer and vice president clinical um, started with 11 regions. It was, uh, this was under a conservative government after lots of effort that Brock led to say we should be moving. We were very late in moving to regionalization in the country compared to the Western provinces. Um, and of course, it was quite fascinating that the need to split the hospital and the community was part of the political process. Uh, I think the community was, was truly terrified of getting swallowed by the hospitals who would eat up all of their resources. Uh, and uh, theretofore, there had not been much productive relationship uh, between those two branches of, uh, of healthcare. Uh, and I think probably legitimate anxiety. Um, there was a change in government, uh, the new government, although a little suspicious because the region had been established by the previous government. And one of those principles was if it's come from another government, you can't trust it, uh, decided to move uh, to regionalization and then surprisingly decided to put the two together to show that they were going to be efficient and did that. Um, and kind of off we went. I, I was interviewed and asked to take the job as the CEO. Um, but once again, these issues that we've already seen. So when I became the VP clinical, there was a delegation of senior nurses from the hospitals coming to the board of the WHA who invited me to attend. So it was a fascinating meeting. I've had a few of those. Uh, suggesting they couldn't possibly see nursing reporting to a physician. It just couldn't possibly happen. It can't work. Uh, we're different professions. It would be very demeaning. Uh, and uh, to my great surprise, the board said, well, we, we don't think that'll be the case. <laughs> and we've made our decision and uh, we carried on. Um, huge resistance from the existing hospital boards that was frankly almost vicious in its, uh, in its approach. Uh, the, the government, uh, of course, faced huge, huge pressure from the faith-based community about how could you possibly take over or take away any of our authority. So there was a faith-based agreement that I think still exists today uh, that in effect made sure that uh, a central authority could never say to a St. Boniface or a Misericordia, now you're doing abortions. Uh, but of course, the concern spread into many other things. That um, my uh, my mother-in-law was a resident at uh, Holy Family. Well, and because the, with this new authority, we were in charge of the personal care homes. And uh, I went to visit her one day, and she was kind of in and out of being lucid. Uh, but I walked into the room one day. And she started yelling at me that, why am I being so mean to Holy Family and taking away the Holochi uh, and, and the Putehea? And I said, Baba, I don't know what you're talking about. The folks, I'm not sure who, I, I haven't wanted to know to tell you the truth. There was someone in administration or the nurses had tried to influence my mother-in-law to get me to back off of being the CEO of a uh, of a regional authority. So it, it was, there were several episodes like that that were, uh, were fat, fascinating, but it was tough to negotiate through this. The, the NDP uh, in winning the election had made a huge fuss of what they called hallway medicine, which is talked about in Gary Philman's new book uh, and probably an unfair attack. Frankly, it was the same everywhere and it led from the federal cuts uh, that uh, really put a huge stress on the system. And of course, both sides, as we established, even though we saved money uh, by reducing duplication and consolidating roles, we saved several million dollars in our first year. Uh, 
administrative dollars, uh, like to refer to it as a bloated bureaucracy. So no, no matter what we did, it was too much of this or not enough of that. Some physician resistance, uh, I have to say, but more openness than you know, I, I think uh, could have happened. We worked hard to develop a, a blueprint for change. We called it a blue book uh, that we had started at the WHA and we're continuing to implement. And it really had a community side, a hospital side, a, a human resource side. It was uh, very well thought out. But when we started that process, I don't know, Brock, if you remember, we met with all of the clinical leaders and we said, okay, this, I think there's an interest now in opening things up and starting to do the things we need to do. What's your advice? What should we do? What's on the list? Uh, and there was quiet in the room that through the previous five years, they'd seen so much discussion, but had given up hope that anything was going to happen or change. And it took us actually time to really convince them that it was worth their effort to think about it. Um, because it's always austere in healthcare. So I think we need to reinforce, even when governments think they're spending a lot of money, there's never enough money to do all the things that people want. But it was the taking away of hope that really got my attention because it was so hard for people to recover and not feel like they were victims. In fact, we spent a fair bit of time in the first few years trying to move them out of this victim uh, feeling that they, you know, had had for so many years before we started setting these future goals. The other thing that was clear to me, and Brock did much of the work leading up to this, was that we really wanted health professionals to be making decisions about clinical care. Uh, and we set up our program management teams with a physician, a nurse, a, a rehab person, and an administrator because all three, the first three all think they manage money brilliantly, but frankly, they do not. Uh, and it worked very well. The money was flowed through these program teams to the hospitals or personal care homes. Uh, the decisions about what program should go to which sites to build centers of excellence were based on this clinical expertise and the groups that were making the clinical decisions. We did reduce duplication, as I said, quite substantially. Uh, we were very clear the reason we were doing all of this was to build a single standard of care. When we first started, every hospital said publicly they were the best in Winnipeg at this or that, hips or knees or breast surgery. Uh, some of them claimed to be among the best in the world. Uh, we couldn't find much data to support that. So we actually started looking for data to support what would a center of excellence look like and began moving in those directions, which continue to be in place in terms of cardiac and neurosurgery and uh, hips and knees. Key issues though, and to the credit of the government of the day, they allowed us to have control of the budgets. They did not intervene about that budget distribution. If you have control of budgets, frankly, you can put up with a lot of other noise that kind of slows you down, but uh, to their credit, they did not back off of that issue. Uh, the other thing, as the hospitals were fighting so desperately and the personal care homes to make sure they didn't lose any autonomy, uh, they failed to recognize that a lot of what was driving both their effort and their costs rested in the hands of physicians. They're the ones ordering the tests, doing the admissions. Uh, and we moved quite quickly under this concept that we want a single standard of care. We should have the same outcome with roughly the same inputs for your hip replacement at this place versus that place. And we created a single medical staff bylaw. And frankly, by the time we knew we had control of the budgets and we had a single medical staff, the ride was bumpy, but frankly, quite manageable. The rest became almost uh, inevitable, much as not everybody could see that. I think the other thing we did, and I've always done, which has been very helpful, is I made all of the budgets transparent. So every, every health agency, every hospital, every personal care home could see everybody else's budget. They could see our budget, they could see the total budget, they could see their share of the budget. Uh, and 
in some ways it was fascinating because we just at our meetings would distribute the spreadsheets and they'd find themselves and they'd look at everybody else that they thought were having better deals over the years. Uh, and the, once you go through that for a couple of cycles, folks stopped fighting about, are we getting our share? They were, they were confident they were getting their share because it was in front of them. Then the question was, how do we better spend it? Not, not are we getting cheated or is someone getting a better deal because it was hidden? Now, I have to say we did discover that there were some unfair distributions based on previous probably political decisions, often years or decades prior uh, that we had to correct. And so that, that was a little bit delicate, uh, but one of the features of, these, of a big region, our budget I think was about 2.5 billion. Uh, if you function within 1%, which is pretty good management by any uh, standard of administration, that gave us 25 million without any discussion from anybody of, of how do we paper this over? How do we fix that in the short term? Uh, and I think that those were really key uh, issues about how, to, how do you move that agenda forward? But once again, there were huge issues of culture, trying to get people to buy into a bigger whole and their important roles in it. Uh, there's some, uh, cute little stories uh, that were part of it. Uh, procurement was a fascinating issue that uh, this is outside of food and laundry. Those things had their own difficulties. You know, the rumor was we were bringing in toast from Toronto uh, to feed to the vets at Deer Lodge who really only wanted bacon. Uh, so you go through all of these kinds of relentless uh, pressures, uh, but we kind of decided that, you know, every surgeon shouldn't be able to totally dictate what kind of suture they used. And every orthopedic surgeon shouldn't be able to use their own, only that joint and not this joint. And we worked to set up what we called PRES committees. I can't remember what PRES stands for anymore, but in essence, clinicians sitting together saying, all right, here's the, here's the group of joints, which ones serve which purposes at which cost. Uh, and it became part of the culture to actually go through this and became very effective. Now, one of the things that we, we dealt with, uh, funny to laugh at now, but our, uh, we really put a lot of pressure. We were the first in the country to say, we don't want any more uh, add backs or add ins or kickbacks, frankly, which is probably the real term for them. When we were going to tender, someone would say, well, we'll give you the CT and we'll give you two ultrasound machines. But all we had in the tender was the CT. So I said, you know that, there's something not right about that. So all we want from you is the best price for the product that met our criteria. And then we would determine which one to buy. And if after we determine that, you wanna give us an ultrasound machine because you're generous and caring, uh, we'd of course be pleased to talk about that. Well, we had already been into this for probably a year and it was working quite effectively, but our CFO uh, who maybe, maybe didn't uh, on that day at least have the best skills dealing with the media. They were asking about it because of some people were complaining about it because we also said that we want the docs to stop having dinner at 529 with the drug companies who were influencing. Uh, so that created a fuss. How can you tell us not to have dinner at 529? Uh, so the media started picking up the fuss and interviewed the CFO, which I thought was a good idea. So he described it accurately. Well, we get these bids and we open and we choose the best product. And then we open the envelope for anything extra at our senior management table. So that became the media story of several months that what was really happening was there was cash in the envelope we opened up after the bids were accepted. And it moved around the senior management table as people extracted cash. So it was absolutely fascinating uh, how this got any traction, but it did. I phoned the auditor, the provincial auditor, who I suspect would have been coming anyway, said, listen, we're happy for you to come take a look. And she came and spent a year looking at it. And a year later published 
a clean report that she later said was amongst the cleanest she's ever done in a public agency. It was only 11 pages long, but it was also on page 11 of the free press. Having spent weeks and weeks and weeks on the front page, uh, a year later, it was page 11. And the other one you know, uh, that I remember uh, very well was the debate around baby formula. And most people don't know this, and I'm, I think we changed it. It may have changed back. Brock may know. In essence, we went to tender for baby formula. And it became evident that we weren't, the tender was you give us the baby formula for free, and then you give us a chunk of cash. So it's your baby formula we give to new moms on the way out, who of course think that's the hospital and doctor recognized baby formula that you should feed your baby for a very long time. So we said, no, enough of that. That's really unethical. We really need to be talking more about breastfeeding and supports of that. And of course, the cash was being used to support lactation consultants in part and, and conferences. So it was being well used. Took a while for our board and all of us to get our heads around walking away from hundreds of thousands of dollars and free formula to try to insist on what? That you actually have to charge us for the formula? Uh, but eventually we said no more money. And for at least a while, we were able to find the resources to continue with the lactation supports. Uh, but it, uh, to me, I always found that a fascinating experience. And then of course, we uh, spent a lot of time uh, based on the talks that we've had so far with the issue of how do we build up our services to indigenous people in the city and in support of the rest of the province. Uh, Kathy Cook uh, came in, it was a, a, just a terrific uh, person and was a terrific asset for years and years. Uh, and now she's a terrific asset at the university. Uh, and, and we created a vice presidency position and a staff and a focus around recruitment of staff, which we improved dramatically, uh, trying to get to a proportion of our staff being indigenous that reflected the community. Uh, we uh, worked hard on the access centers and a downtown access center became part of a new building uh, to support that community. So it became a theme uh, of how do we support some of these needs, even through a, a larger coordination. Um, so I think I'll maybe take a break there and see if there's any questions. Sure, wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Postal. Um, perfect timing. I do actually have one um, from Melanie McKinnon here online. Um, thank you, Dr. Postal, for your leadership in 40 plus years commitment to Indigenous communities, access to equitable health services. What advice or expectations would you share with your successor and all health leaders of their shared responsibility to affect change and improve services and healthcare experiences for our Indigenous populations? Well, you know, we can't when we talk about moving the dial on improving health status in a population, our own, the whole population, the whole province, uh, frankly, that's not going to happen unless we improve the health status of Indigenous people. At 20% at of our population, we are not going to move the dial unless we substantively move the dial in that community. So some of it's just selfish. If, if we want to improve health status, if we want to reduce the draw on services that ill health status brings with it, uh, it's an absolute necessity. Maybe more importantly, it's just uh, not ethical. It's, it's not right that we would have a proportion of our community so disadvantaged historically and through you know, what the TRC calls cultural genocide, uh, systemic racism, all those terms, uh, I think, are opening up the discussion more and more. And I come to that a little bit later. But it's, it's a necessity. It's ethically responsible and necessary. Uh, and uh, I just don't see it. I don't, I don't know how it could be seen as an optional experience. Thank you. Um, I had a question that popped into my head as you were um, chatting. You referenced both the Winnipeg Free Press and, and the CBC, and I'm, I'm just wondering, given that you have much more experience than many of us with the media throughout your, your decades, I'm, I'm doing this not as a curveball, I swear, um, but if you can reflect a little bit on 
you know, the role of health leadership in that relationship with the media and some of your experiences and lessons learned? Well, you know, they, they, my answer today is probably different than it would have been in 2010, you know, where I faced the media almost many days a week, if not on a daily basis. You know, they've got a job to do. They, they are, um, to some extent, the way of looking at what's going on in the public sector and the political sector and exposing things that aren't right. Um, and I think we have to both respect that role and support that role. At the same time, they're also in the business of selling stories uh, and it's not too uncommon uh, for stories to take a life that isn't entirely fair or objective, but is a good story. So it continues uh, to be used as a story because it attracts attention and therefore sells, uh, sells uh, newspapers and or other things. So it's a hard balance. Some of them are remarkably skilled and ethical and fair. Uh, we've had experience with others that were remarkably dishonest, you know, sneaking uh, into uh, meetings with uh, parents of children who had died in the cardiac inquest, uh, pretending to be family matters so they could hear what was going on. Uh, so, you know, that's like all of society. There's a mixed bag, some wonderful uh, folks in the media and some folks that you learn you can't quite trust because, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not necessarily going to be fair or honest. Uh, in, in some ways, they're always your friend, right? They, uh, they're very skilled at trying to make you comfortable, so you might say a little more. So the need to have some media savvy when you're in any kind of leadership role is, uh, I think, an important one. And frankly, I think they respect that. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Yeah, Brian, just to expand on that for a moment, I mean, a number of the positions uh, that you've, the senior positions that you've held, you know that there's limits to your influence or power, so to speak. There's many different groups that um, want to or feel that they should be able to dictate how services are provided and how things are done, be that the media itself at times, boards of directors, uh, certainly the government, uh, the department, accrediting bodies, unions, regulatory bodies. I mean, the list goes on. And those are all well-meaning groups who all feel that they have a particular role to play in dictating and determining how certain things are done. And, uh, you know, a common theme, as you've expressed it in your presentation today throughout your career, has been that real, uh, real passion and focus around equity, and particularly as it relates to Indigenous. And, you know, you've, you've, you really worked hard over the years to address those issues. Um, but as you were talking about earlier, you know, the, the progress has been mixed over the years, right? It's not perhaps as, as far along as you would have hoped 40 years ago, 30 years ago, but it's, there's definitely been progress, but one is always looking for more progress. So as speaking now to the students who are focusing on leadership and thinking about their own leadership style, when they get into situations where they're dealing with multiple stakeholders, government may be one of them, and they're passionate and concerned about the welfare of their patients or their clients or their students. Uh, any, you, you talked earlier about the importance of focusing on data, being data-driven. You talked about you know, being passionate. Anything else you'd want to say in terms of, like, how did you survive all those years and not get terribly cynical at various points in time? And just you know, throw your hands up in frustration. Like, what kind of kept you going? And any words of wisdom for the students? Well, you know, I th I think it's really about finding, uh, trying to find uh, balance, to try to listen to what they are trying to achieve, to see if there are parts of that that are actually things you may not have thought of that you might be able to accommodate. Uh, or things that are so far contrary to what you believe to be true that you have to say that and stand up to it. So I think it's listening, it's uh, finding balance, it's standing up to it when it uh, doesn't feel right so that they, they know what you're thinking as well. 
and then sorting out if there are ways to accommodate some things without, without um, compromising what you think needs to be done. Uh, I would say as a basic rule, people get passionate. No one minds passion. If you start getting angry or attacking, uh, frankly, you've lost your effectiveness at that moment. Folks will stop listening and they will use that against you in the future. They're just an angry person. Uh, so containing anger at the same time you're showing passion is something I think people have to learn to do. Just as, uh, just as you were talking, Brian, I was reflecting on, uh, on uh, some of your experiences when you were CEO of uh, WRJ. And one of the things I observed was that, um, and you read about this in the management literature, is that um, you really took advantage of strategic moments. In other words, in, in my view, you always had a, a kind of a list in the back of your head of a dozen different things that you really wanted to advance, wanted to achieve. And, uh, and then you, you, you'd kind of, when the moment was right, you'd spring it on, be it government or whomever. Uh, I'm thinking of, um, of the gamma knife, for example. I, don't, I wonder if you could just share something, an experience like that. And... Uh, yeah, I've still got a lot more of my talk, but that, uh, uh, well, the gamma knife was fascinating because the, uh, I think for whatever reason, the premier of the day had a lot of trust in me and wanted me at tables where things were being discussed. And we were about to go into a federal provincial meeting uh, and like might have been 2003 and four when the, uh, when the healthcare accords were coming, he wanted to do something that was uh, for Manitoba, you know, that would make Manitoba stand out a bit in these very competitive environments. So we had, we went around the table and uh, I listened, I carefully listened. I didn't try to insert, um, but I could feel him, he kept looking at me uh, and uh, he was expecting me to say something. And of course we had uh, within a few years of that recruited Michael West back from Cleveland to help rebuild our neurosurgery program. You'll remember that well. And Michael had been in my ear and Michael's a gentle but convincing way that a gamma knife would be a real important addition to progressing neurosurgical care. Uh, so everybody had had a chance going around the table and the premier turned to me almost irritated that I had nothing to say. And he said, well, what would you do? Uh, and I say, I'd, I'd buy a gamma knife. And he said, what's a gamma knife? I said, it fries brain tumors, so you don't have to open up the brain. He thought for about 10 seconds and said, okay, we'll buy a gamma knife. And that night, it was, it was almost hysterical. Uh, a gamma knife was uh, on emergency, or ER, the, the TV series. They had a patient with a gamma knife, saved his life, and it caused such uproar that we were now getting a gamma knife the first in Canada, and we had set the premier up to negotiate that it would be the only one in Canada. The other premiers agreed if we bought it, they would send their patients who could access the gamma knife to Winnipeg, which happened for years. Well, three or four years later, I got a call from the University Health Network, a good friend who was the CEO saying, Brian, you got to help me. And I said, well, what's up? He says, my neurosurgeons are going crazy. I said, well, yeah, well, what are they going crazy about? He says, you have a gamma knife. I said, oh yeah, they don't have a gamma knife. We have a donor who will buy us a gamma knife. I said, so why are you calling? My premier said we could only get a gamma knife if you said it was okay. Uh, so I said, I'll, we'll think about it. <laughs> and we hung up and I phoned them back a few days later because they'll say, of course, you know, it's not. It's, it's always knowing what you need to get done and then seeing if opportunities arrive that fits in quickly. Because often when governments need to go, you know, they're in some form of political trouble and they need to show something, 
They don't have the time to say, and now we'd like you to take a year and a half to develop a full proposal to let us know how you'd accomplish this. It's what can we do today, announce in a week or a month uh, and get started on. So there's actually an impact. So from my time in regionalization, of course, it's changed. Uh, so I don't want to cover that ground too much because I, I wasn't there. But uh, before I left, Brock mentioned that I had the opportunity to serve on a bunch of things nationally, which were terrific experiences because you really got a sense of health policy in every province, uh, what the importance of data was through Kaihai and how data was both valued and resisted at the same time, which is another talk. Uh, the Health Council was created and I was a founding member uh, and it was a federal creature. Uh, the first meeting, the Minister of Health from BC, who was the lead minister, there's always a lead minister for health, uh, came in and told us that he had no interest in anything we had to say and that uh, don't expect the provinces to buy into anything that you have to say about health. And that's exactly what happened and eventually it was wrapped up. Uh, but I also had the opportunity to serve as an advisor to the Prime Minister uh, on wait times coming out of the Accords, $5.5 billion and how to distribute it. Uh, I've often kind of teased myself about why would they phone me and I think uh, the conclusion I drew was that they needed someone who had run a big health system. It couldn't be anybody from Ontario because everybody hated Ontario and it would be handy to have a physician because maybe someone would listen. I think I was the only physician in the country in that role. So I don't think it was any particular skill set that they thought I had. I think I just met, you know, the, what they punched out. But it was fascinating. They had already determined five areas of interest. Um, the conclusion, and the five areas had nothing to do with me. They came in a spectacular way from the politicians who were hearing these five issues on the doors, the doors they knocked on, nothing to do with any data. There was never any data to support these five that would be particularly useful. Um, but the fascinating part to me was two things. One, it was very clear. I spent a year, you'll remember, because you had to help fill in, uh, going from province to Ottawa to province. To, so it was this shuttle kind of diplomacy, trying to get them engaged in how to move forward with uh, wait time management, which was really nothing all that fancy. It was in effect queuing theory and trying to get physicians to stop telling their patients, yes, I have a long waiting list because I'm the best. Therefore, you know, you should stay with me because I'm the best. Physicians seeing these waiting lists as their future mortgage payments. It's unclear that they, it was hard for them to recognize that the list would keep replenishing. So some resistance to it, but it was quite clear the provinces had very little trust of the feds or each other. And I think that continues to this day. Couldn't even talk to each other, couldn't agree on agendas at a meeting, who should be at the meeting. Uh, and the feds had very little understanding of how health systems in the provinces worked. They just, they just didn't know. All they were used to was giving more money to them uh, and not having any accountability. Uh, and then of course, as many will remember, there was a bit of a chopped liver effect. Suddenly the orthopods and the cardiac and the ophthalmologists were very busy with more and more surgery and therefore more and more income. Uh, and the general surgeons <laughs> And the plastic surgeons were getting pretty grouchy about watching this going on with them not having a share of it. So there were some unintended consequences, no question of what, uh, what that brought to, to the system and the structure. Um, I, I think two things, uh, just as I was leaving the region, uh, was the death of Brian Sinclair uh, and the inquest that followed. Uh, and I think that really got a lot of public attention, which I think, you know, certainly the death wasn't positive and the circumstance wasn't, but I think in a positive way began to educate the public around this issue of systemic racism, intentional or unintentional, it's real. Uh, and the issue of stereotyping that, uh, you know, I think is an inherent part of, uh, of racism it was devastating to folks working in the health system. I think it was devastating to the community, indigenous communities. Uh, 
but I think it was one of an earlier step in getting the whole public to start thinking about these issues. Uh, and of course, uh, Jordan Rivers uh, dying in hospital that ultimately led to uh, Jordan's principal and, uh, and now a relatively large infusion of cash to say, uh, just to remind folks, so that was an Indigenous child with a very complex illness in hospital, um, probably dischargeable because hospitals are not places to grow up into a medical foster home. Uh, the federal government and provinces would not agree on who would pay for it because of this jurisdictional debate. Uh, the, the child ended up dying in hospital uh, rather than being allowed to uh, have a more productive relationship uh, in a, in a foster med medical foster home. Uh, Cindy Blackstock, who's the Director of Child and Family Caring Society, really was the one that deserves credit for pursuing and pursuing and pursuing this, uh, and ultimately did get, uh, interestingly, several uh, efforts to add money through Jordan's principle that got broader and broader, not just healthcare, but education and social services. Uh, many of those dictated by the Human Rights Tribunal of Canada, directing the federal government, who most often resisted that for a significant period of time before allowing it, and even now is resisting one of their rulings that children who have been taken into care deserve compensation, as do their families. I'm talking about foster care. Uh, the feds continue to uh, resist that in the courts. Uh, the cost will be large, so maybe that is an issue. But once again, I think those things uh, continue to come back and haunt us. And of course, I think two areas that really are beginning, I think, to have a public impact on this issue, which I, I I think, I hope is a positive course, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which came out of a federal apology and settlement uh, around uh, residential schools, uh, created a remarkable report with, uh, I think, 94 recommendations, all remarkably relevant. Um, and I think that has awakened the public, uh, that it got enough attention and seemed so horrible, uh, and you saw uh, things like uh, the uh, tragically hip talk about this young uh, person who tried running away from the residential or from the residential school in Kenora and died, in effect froze to death. Uh, so you see this waking up, and of course, I think that's even been further now contributed to to the issue of unmarked graves and. At Kelowna and Kavasis, and, uh, and I'm sure there'll be many, many other places where that's discovered. So I think those things are horrible to think about, but in the end, I think do make a contribution to the public becoming more aware, which then creates the environment where both levels of government uh, know they have to start paying more attention. And you could see it came up during the election campaign, not as much as I thought it might, to tell you the truth, uh, but clearly was there uh, and the issue of uh, reconciliation. Uh, briefly, you know, the university role, um, I think has been fascinating. We started when I first started, we had a lot of accreditation stresses that a great many people uh, did a lot of work uh, fixing. Uh, our most recent accreditation was probably the best in the country uh, for a long period of time. Um, we continue to provide uh, as support as best we can to Angamazin because I think that is also central to how we train all of our health students that they a, see that there's actual a practical application. We do work, uh, but that there's also educational and research components that uh, are really important. I think one of the things we did, uh, uh, which I had also previously done as we arrived, I thought the faculty was stone cold broke, uh, discovered about uh, $17 million in carryover funds. That never made sense to me, frankly, it just becomes a target to government and should become a target to government. So uh, 
there was a little bit of dispute about it, but it didn't last very long. We took 10 million, built some research platforms, education platforms. Lo and behold, the next year, the carryover was still 14 million. So we, we've kind of created the pattern of we take the carryover and then you can apply for its use. And if a good idea will be recognized. Uh, our research productivity continues to go up. We're sitting at about 100 million annually. It's about third clinical research, a third basic science research, and a third community health sciences, which is, uh, I think that uh, that merger so long ago has really been positive. Uh, I started, there was a huge pressure to build a medical school in Brandon, uh, which really had me pulling out whatever hair I had left at that point in time. But uh, we got through a year of process to conclude that what we needed was more satellites. And we've done that. We, our distributed models now are in, in six or seven sites. Uh, half our family medicine residents are being trained outside of the city. Uh, and to nobody's surprise, once trained there, they're actually staying there. So uh, I think that's been positive. The issue of bringing together five college or five faculties into a single faculty uh, was, as, as you'd expect, an interesting experience. And was in some ways very similar to discussions that are between professions. You know, should it be a doctor? Does it have to be a doctor? You know, uh, how do you get into bed with medicine, which is, you know, 80 or 85% of the, of the size uh, and in terms of you know, students and research productivity, all those things kind of make it a pretty big uh, something to want to get into bed with. But I, I think it's come together well and in good faith. I think all five deans have worked together very well and are committed to the main purpose of it all was to build uh, interprofessional collaboration uh, and uh, really convinced that the future of healthcare is going to rest in healthcare teams, not in these silos, that we have to learn how to work more effectively in those teams. And it needs to involve all of the health professions. So I think this has been a vehicle to get that started. Uh, we've got a very committed group working on it and doing, I think, quite remarkable work pulling it together. All of the students fit into cohorts of seven or eight in their first year and do projects together from the five colleges. So I think that that's been positive. We've got many places in the country looking at it. Um, but always the same issue, who should, who should be in charge? And I think that's a, a fascinating kind of social dilemma. Uh, we also, uh, because we're funded by the people of Manitoba, I was really sensitive that most of our residency positions should go to our graduates because we did a study when I first arrived that said, if you do your medical school in Manitoba, you're about 50% likely to be here for your career. If you do a medical school and your residency in Manitoba, it's closer to 80%. So we said, well, if that's the case, let's say 70% of all of our positions need to go to Manitoba grads. Some resistance to it. Uh, because every program thinks they have the best selection criteria, you know, in the world, and they know exactly what they're doing, and uh, and we can't. We want the best and brightest. So then we had to say, well, we know they're pretty bright when they come in. If they're not the best and brightest when they're applying to your programs, whose fault is that? Like, who do you think is teaching them to be the best and brightest? So it's worked well, in particular with the support of uh, family medicine. We've just done a remarkable job in many, many things uh, during, during my term. And Jose Francois, I think, has been a terrific you know, leader most recently. We are beginning to look at the joint admission kind of discussions. How do, we, how do we use some of the things we've done in one college or another that seem to be working and move them? All of the colleges have really gotten engaged around uh, rural outreach and indigenous care. And I think that's positive. We now have two coordinators uh, that spend their, their job is to get our students out into placements outside of the perimeter. And I think COVID's been a bit of a problem with that, but I think it's really gone, uh, gone very well. And then of course, you, you can't, you can't uh, be in these kinds of jobs without worrying about equity, diversity, and inclusion. 
uh, and we worked hard on that. We have uh, clearly a policy and a statement signed by all deans. We've got an anti-racism policy that's now used all over the country. Uh, and uh, our leaders in this area just drafted a remarkable uh, statement, frankly. Uh, and uh, we started a uh, low socioeconomic uh, program for intake into medicine. Uh, and we're continuing to look at how do we level the playing field for intake into these colleges so that uh, it's what we're trying to measure is not only your intellect, you clearly need some horsepower, but also your empathy, your social understanding, uh, your, your view of the role of a health professional and the ethic that must come with it. Uh, and I think, frankly, it's working this year. 35% uh, of uh, our intake in medicine were visible minorities. Uh, and that's roughly the proportion of visible minorities uh, in Manitoba. So I think we've really moved a long way in the last uh, decade. 60% are women. Uh, I think that that's very important. Uh, and for the first time ever, 17 indigenous students. So uh, you know, I think these efforts, if you stick to them, actually do have an impact but it, they're not always easy to stick to because in the end, you appear to be selecting against others when you're trying to select uh, uh, a, a, a different group to face uh, at, at inaugural exercises. Um, you know, I think I'll stop it there. We spent a lot of time on professionalism and uh, learning assessments, which have been difficult. We kind of concluded with Michael West a few years ago that rather than looking at the learning environment when there's trouble, why don't we look at the learning environment continuously and, uh, and in a cycle? And those reports are now very helpful. They point out where we're having some troubles and we are having some trouble certainly in postgraduate uh, in some areas that we worry about accreditation processes. Uh, but of course, that gives us something to work on for the next few months. But let, let me stop it there and see if there are any more questions. Yeah, absolutely. There sure are. Our audience has warmed up to the questions. Um, so I'm going to combine a couple of questions into two larger questions for you because there's a couple of themes emerging. So a few folks have um, asked if you could reflect on um, maybe something that you deemed a failure in, in trying to enact a change or a mistake you made or... Um, a time that if you could hit the rewind button, is there anything that you would go back and redo or any lessons that you learned that future leaders could apply? Um, I don't think there's anything that I've ever walked away from saying, you know, I've really, I've really blown that. I might have liked to have stopped the cardiac program, you know, a month earlier and maybe saved a child or two months earlier. Uh, but I, I wasn't in the administrative position that I felt I actually had the power to do that. Uh, and there were so many conflicting views of what was going on. It was really hard to get a handle on it. So I, I think that would, would be one area. Uh, I think I would have liked to have done more around rural Manitoba issues earlier. Uh, you know, I think it's worked, but why did it need to take this long to get there? It's kind of, it seems to me to be self-evident that we, we could and should have done more. Um, I, you know, I think you sometimes wonder whether you should have put up with all the wackiness you had to put up with uh, from governments or universities or hospital boards or, uh, but I, uh, you know, the, you, you only get the blow up once. So uh, you, it, uh, you get some satisfaction out of it, but um, ultimately it also takes you out of the picture and you're not gonna have any further impact. So, you know, I think we have, you have to be careful with that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the second question related to sort of balancing the day-to-day -day and getting back to those root causes and understanding that there's, you know, these root causes and these inequities that you're fighting on a larger scale, but you still have to balance the day-to-day. -day. And so one of the specific questions was, what advice would you give to clinician leaders to balance the day-to-day -day need to provide immediate care to patients to help with their underlying conditions 
with the knowledge that the underlying health inequities are the real issues that need to be solved. Yeah, I clearly, you know, I, and I think I, as I said earlier, people are remarkably dedicated to patient care and I, I would never want to see that eroded. You know, I, I think um, I said this at a rounds once and I, and I, I meant it, I, I think it may have seemed too facile, is you, you have to learn how to say yes to things. So even though you're busy, you know, if you get a chance to kind of sit on a committee that may have a bit of influence or uh, someone asks you to take something on that, you know, would make a difference, uh, I think just try to find a way to do it. Uh, and you know, part of the issue for leaders uh, that you need some experience, I think, to get and some instinct about it is to make sure you're working with good people when you have that. Uh, and if you don't think you're working with good people, then don't wait too long to make a change. And two, to trust those people and open doors for them and turn them loose. And occasionally, occasionally you've got to rein them in or they weren't aware of something. And, but most often, frankly, you got to keep up to them. Uh, and uh, you get a lot more done because there's a lot more brains working at it. And uh, so the, the act of, of delegation and allowing people to get out there. So I'll bring us back to that question from the very beginning from Dr. Doyle about never ever compromising the high road and whether or not you want to reflect any further on that. Well, you know, you got to live with yourself. Uh, and I think that's the basic test. So if, if you're getting too uncomfortable with what you're being forced into, then frankly, get out. Uh, so I think the idea of, uh, I was never smart enough to remember lies. So I was always very careful to say what I thought. Uh, and it usually happened to be the same thing I thought three months ago. So there was always consistency because people, people lock, latch on to inconsistency, bright people in about a tenth of a second. And when they catch you being inconsistent, they've got you. Uh, mm -hmm. It's uh, so don't make anything up. If you don't say, I don't know, but I'm, I'll, I'll work to get that figured out. Uh, don't lie for sure, because people always get caught uh, with lying. And then frankly, they have lost any capacity of influence. And then you've got to determine if something is just so untenable to you that you've got to say, I've got to, I've got to go. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring Dr. Wright up, I think, for one final question for the evening, or for some final thoughts. Brian, maybe we could just uh, end with your thoughts about, um, from your vantage point, uh, the future of the healthcare system. So a major focus over the last, you know, there's always, uh, as over the last 40 years, there's been different points in time where different issues have been prominent and have been a focus. And I'd say over the last several years, uh, a major theme or focus has been the sustainability of the healthcare system. That's always been there, but it's been a particular theme uh, more recently. And um, just interested in your thoughts. I mean, in Manitoba right now, uh, over the last several years, there's been a real concerted effort to establish a more of a truly provincial healthcare system where all the various components of the healthcare system are working in unison, where they're planning together, where they're, and it really was taking what you had initiated in the regional structure in 2000, in the late 90s, you know, the idea of we need to better integrate and coordinate what's happening in, in Winnipeg, stop the unnecessary and unproductive competition and have everybody kind of work planning together, working together, consistent standards of practice, as you said. And it's really taking that now to the provincial level. Do you think that there's any real opportunity to do that at a national level? You talked earlier about the difficulty of, so let me, I have two questions, but that's the first one. So in terms of the sustainability of the health system, what are your thoughts about the ability to do some of that planning and integration and coordination at a national level, you know, beyond just a provincial level. Is that a pipe dream or is that something that should still be pursued? Yeah, listen, at a provincial level, I, I think it's exactly the right thing to do. And is that extension? Well, how could you 
say that something in Dauphin can be of less quality of outcome than something in Winnipeg or Killarney. So I think that's obvious. It's unclear to me, and we've talked about this, that the structure that's in place will be able to deliver that. And I worry about that a lot. And I'm, as you know, I've been pretty vocal about that in the, in the new structure. So I think that needs to be looked at and may need some adjustment. Uh, you know, I think it's as sustainable as we want it to be. And, you know, is 43% the right number? Who knows, but I don't think it's the wrong number. And it's certainly what the public wants. Uh, and the question then is, how do you balance the needs and the services against the costs that are required? Uh, and then how do you explore ways of holding those things together? I, I don't honestly believe it's impossible. And I think sometimes we get too excited in one direction or the other. You know, we, we need to cut costs and, and really trim the system. And then all of a sudden there's big trouble with wait times and waiting lists and unhappy public. So then we pour money into the system. So to me, one of the ways to sustain it is, is to stop with all of this wave action, you know, of overspending, underspending, overspending, underspending, because I think the act of recovery from a period of underspending is very expensive. And then you create expectations as you catch up, which then creates the need for more underspending because you will, you've exceeded where you were in the first place. Uh, at a national level, I, I personally don't think there's any hope of, uh, of the constitution is not going to be changed. The provinces both love and hate healthcare uh, because they can claim great credit when it's working uh, and they can blame the federal government when it's not and we need to give us more money. Uh, and the federal government uh, has trapped themselves, I think for the right reasons, in using their spending power to support health care in the provinces. And that's now never going to end. Um, so I think we should just be used to the debate, you know, that the provinces will want more and the feds will want to dictate where it's spent and we'll be going back and forth depending on the political cycles to see where, where we come down. The provinces frankly have no love of each other. So it's not like they're incapable to coordinate systems. Uh, you see in the debate around a national pharmacare program, there's huge division in the provinces of what they would want from it. Uh, if the feds pay 100% of the bill, they're quite happy with it. If uh, the feds are only paying a share, it's not gonna be enough. Uh, so I, I personally think uh, that we, we have the system that we put in place uh, with the BNA Act, and I don't see that it's changeable. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Postal. This has been an absolute pleasure on behalf of Center for Healthcare Innovation, the University of Manitoba. Um, it's been my pleasure as I start in my leadership journey to watch and learn from you. Um, as a Manitoban, I, I see and I, I feel the effect that you have had on our healthcare system. Um, and I'm sure we have a couple hundred people online here. I'm sure all of them have a story of how you have affected their day to day. So thank you for that. Um, thank you for Dr. Wright to talk to Wright for coming in here and joining us today. And, and to everyone that has joined us at home, I know evenings and time with family is, is precious and few and far between. So we thank you for coming to this important dialogue. Um, and we wish you all the best in the next adventure of your career, Dr. Postal. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.